to have church today. Yes, sir. Are you ready? I just don't know how you're sitting there. I'd be up dancing and cat. As a matter of fact, Diana pulls me down quite a bit. Bless well, you. not really. She wants to dance with me. Well, I believe that. <laughs> We're going to have a good time. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He taught me and he taught me. scriptures to put up on the board. And so between he and Gary, I appreciate him every Sunday because Gary's down here <laughs> quietly filming everything. Is, and then Keith's in the back running everything. We appreciate that. And if, you know, if you know somebody that's, that's, that's not tuned in to the service this morning live, they can find it on YouTube later on this, today. Yes, sir. Keith does that. Yep, it's a blessing. Thank you, Keith. Thank you very much. Well, thank the band, man. Y'all got me going again this morning. 
firing on all sides. You know, I hate to say it, but I think one guy's starting to overshadow everybody. Wayne back there, you know, where everybody really went nuts and started clapping when you mentioned his name. <laughs> How long you been here now, Wayne? Been here yeah. about 30 minutes. Never mind. Don't ever ask Wayne Bennett a question. I won't ask. Trying to be nice. Well, Lord, give him some oh, Two questions. Yeah. Wayne's it's, been with us over here about three years, I think. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. But definitely a rock up here. That's it. He's the rock man. I know. We can't go nowhere. Without him. I know. And unlike you, we keep asking him back. I know it. Never you just keep showing up. <laughs> pray, pray I have yet to be hired, folks. I've never been hired. <laughs> It's a week-to-week -week proposition. Let That's because we're not a right to fire state, I think. Or something like that. <laughs> anyway, we're having too much fun, but I'm ready to have some church. Would you open us with a prayer? Sure, if y'all bow me, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning to, to worship you and praise you. And we thank you for this church and just the, the wonderful ministries that are happening here. And Father, we pray that we can live a life of kindness and patience and forgive others as you forgive us. And uh, Father, help us grow in wisdom and faithfulness so that we can live the life that you would have us to live. Father, be with us as we leave this week. And just watch over us. We'll just thank you and praise and ask these things in your name. Amen. 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 Now, the scripture I'm going to be reading from today is Jeremiah 32, uh, 38 through 42. It says, They shall be my people, and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart, one way, that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so they will not depart from me. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. You know, because we uh, serve a living God, you know, Christianity is more about a relationship with God than it is about rules. Uh, yeah. and, and we've been given the greatest gift of all time through Christ. But a promise this way is indeed the only way to God. He's made us an everlasting promise. It says, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. And we discussed this in, in Bible study. You know, when it says fear, it doesn't mean to be afraid of God. Fear means respect, it means reverence, and it means honor. And in Proverbs, it tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, and we're, we're in Proverbs now, and we're studying wisdom. Um, it, but it says, an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from doing them good. God has committed to us because he's made us an everlasting covenant. In our day and age, we're, we're used to uh, in it, going into business contracts uh, where somebody can back out of the contract if, if somebody doesn't follow through or somebody doesn't do what, what we want them to do. But God's not like us. You know, God makes not only a, a covenant, but an everlasting, eternal covenant with each and every one of us. You know, there's no end to God's commitment to doing us good. You know, God will never turn away from his own, and he will never, ever cease to do good for his children. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. I always look forward to this. Oh, yeah. Aren't you glad to have him here? Yes, sir. It's a blessing. It's a D for Dad. Some lawyers can win, and the doctor can heal. Your old banker can lend Till all your pockets are filled But it closes a case Of a sin straight down soul For all the problems you face There's only one place to go
Tuesday nights we have our team roping down at the arena. Starts at 7 o'clock. Then on Thursday evenings we've got our open riding night and barrel practice. So I want to encourage everybody to be here for that. You can come watch. It's a good time. And also we want to encourage people to get involved in these teams. Uh, you know, we've got the arena team which takes care of everything. But then we've got some smaller teams that are going to handle barrel racing, play days, and roping. So it doesn't matter, you know, if you're roping or not, we'd love to have, or, or riding barrels, get involved with the teams because we need all hands on deck. It's important because we want to start holding events, not to have events, but to bring people in from outside and have an opportunity to use this arena as a, an outreach ministry, which is what it's for. And we've been so blessed to have this arena and to put it in, and now it's time to use it as the church because every time we are doing something down there, there is a time of devotion. And that's really important because it is an outreach we can use to this community. Uh, Brian, do you have anything on the arena this week? Oh, well, let's, let's remember that we're going to have our thing this Saturday. So, you know, we're running short on time. Let's remember that. Let's get it started Excellent. We're going to take till about Wednesday on people that want to observe. That way we'll know how much food to prepare. So Wednesday's kind of the cutoff day on if you want, want to come and watch the clinic. You know, just sit and watch and bring your lunch here. And we're going to have a meeting after church. And we need a few things we need to talk about as far as organization, you know, parking cars, you know, kind of security around and, you know, maybe serving some Just some little things like that, but we're well on track. I've got the restroom in order. They're working. I don't have the stall dividers in, but we do have restrooms. So that, that's, been, that's been a challenge, but we got it. So and we've got plenty of trees out back, too, right? <laughs> Just check. Oh, mercy. Well, let's see. What I, well, I'll tell you what. Now, before we get to the birthdays, I do want to announce something that is very, very special to me, very dear to my heart. But next Sunday, we're going to call Ordination Sunday. And invite your friends, invite people if you hadn't seen them at church for a while, because next Sunday, we're going to be, uh, Mike is going to become an ordained pastor. So. And so next Sunday for, uh, next Sunday we do, and Fred, I won't forget, we've got our fellowship lunch next Sunday. Now you think about it, there's going to be a lot of folks showing up for the ordination and all, so we need to feed folks. I mean, I mean, let's let's fill it. Tell them, Carl. Let's fill it up in there with food. Oh, right? listen, listen, this is some, this is some. I gained three pounds just talking about it. There you go. Du is it double dessert Sunday? Do what? Double dessert Sunday? I hope so. Diana's going to bring one. I had had some of it last week, and I said you need to take that to church. There you. 
It ain't going to be two weeks old, is it? Yeah, pretty much. But it, it must be good. It must be good if it's still good two weeks later. Sounds You're like not going to believe it either. Good. I, I want to pull a piece off to the side before church. I only weighed 140 pounds when we met. Now look at me. She can cook. I know it. No, and not only are we going to do, and now I'm going to irritate Dean too, because not only is it ordination Sunday, but I would like to recognize next Sunday not only Mike, who's becoming an ordained pastor, but Brian is the deacon and Dean is the church elder because they really don't get, you know, a lot of recognition. And every year y'all are really sweet and y'all do it, you know, Pastor Appreciation Sunday. But what you don't realize is, is these three men are watching over my shoulder, giving me instructions, helping me out. I mean, they don't know how much they help. And so we meet together. We work to plan on things for the church. And so Dean Spence, Brian Commendator, and, and Mike, we want to appreciate all three of them next Sunday. And I know we got a few birthdays week uh, this week. Who, who's got a birthday this week? Come on, don't fib. Oh, we in. know Ken is. Look, he's trying to sniff his cup. I know it's his birthday. Yeah, we got two? All right, well, Carl, there might be a couple playing possum, but let's go ahead and sing to him. Happy birthday to you. everybody get up, walk around the room, greet each other this morning, tell everybody good morning.
part of this church? You do. Do you know why? You don't know that? Princess, tell me no. Tell me it's not true. Do you know that we stop every church service for this special time for us to be up here by ourselves? Yeah? Well, you know what I want to, I wanna, want y'all to start doing? I want y'all, when y'all go back to your children's church time, I want each one of you to take turns, because these ladies are good at organizing. I don't organize anything. But I want y'all to each bring a Bible verse once a week. One person bring a verse, and I want you to share it with us up here. How about that? Yeah, like you did a long time ago. So each week, take a turn of bringing a Bible verse that you like, and we'll talk about it when you have it up here. How, would you like to do that? We'd love to hear it, because we love y'all so much, and you're so important to this church that we have this time where they're not even paying attention and we just get to have our own church up here. Isn't that cool? 
I want you to bring your Bible. You can read it. I'll even put the microphone in front of you. How about that? Well, you know what I want to talk about today? Do you know in the Bible it does not say the word, or God doesn't tell anybody to tell other folks they're sorry? Well, we tell people we're sorry all the time, don't we? Yeah, and it's a nice thing to do, but do you know what God wants us to do? Because when we mess up with God, he doesn't want us to say, hey, God, I'm sorry, does he? He wants us to ask him to be forgiven. Yeah, so we say, instead of saying, oh, sorry, God, we say, God, will you forgive me? And guess what God does? That's right. He forgives us. And the same way, if we do something that hurts somebody else, what, do we, what should we do? Say, will you forgive me? That's right. And then the person knows you want to be forgiven, and they have a chance to be godlike and forgive you. Just like if somebody did something to you, how would you feel if they came up and said, will you forgive me? How would that make you feel? It would make you feel good, right? And you have a chance to forgive them. And Jesus says that we're to forgive. That's right. Exactly. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, Lord. thank you for forgiving me and help me to forgive others. Amen. I stood in the courtroom Judge turned my way Looks like you're guilty What do you say? I spoke up your honor I have no defense That's when mercy walked in Mercy job of correcting me on things. You know, years ago, I heard people talk about this pastor. He said, every week, all he ever does is talk about his family. So, and they said, well, we sure get tired of hearing about that. So, I make it a deal to just never talk about my family in church. I just want to share the message of God, but I want to share two little things this morning. One, my daughter had her baby this week. Yeah! So, Uncle Colt. That's right, Uncle Colt. Yep, so, so what a praise, and also, I'm going to get Uncle Colt to stand up. So I can embarrass him. Stand up. There's girlfriend just nudging. 
I just want to give him a praise because he's a good, godly young man. He's also the number one quarterback in the state of Texas and tied for second. And, and he's tied for second in the nation right now in high school football. And what a lot of people don't know is the last two games he's been pulled out way early in the game when they get the score up too high. So he's been a, it's been a real blessing to watch that grow from little bitty up to now. So just a big blessing that he's – He's being a young man of God. Yeah, here comes. Yep. You know, and now that I've mentioned him, I'll, I'll say this. You know, back when he was younger, I started teaching him something. And that was when, when you did something that hurt somebody, like I was talking to the kids about, you've done something that might offend somebody. Oh, I say, you should say, I'm sorry. That's what we do, don't we? We teach our kids that. You do something like that, you tell them, I'm sorry. I've done this and I'm sorry. But, and I preached about this years ago, but did you ever notice in the Bible, like I told the kids, God doesn't tell us to tell people we're sorry, does he? Never in the Bible do I see the word, tell somebody, I'm sorry, or you should be sorry. But I'll tell you what the word of God does say, forgive. Forgiveness. Forgiven. And forgives. Y'all know I like to ask questions in my sermons. Why do you think, why do you think God wants us to ask for forgiveness instead of just say, I'm sorry? I believe it's because saying I'm sorry doesn't require a response from someone else. It doesn't require action from either side. It doesn't require anybody to do anything. And I'll give you an example. We all know that sometimes I tend to speak without thinking. It's just word to mouth and it bypasses. Don't choke, Jimbo. But if, you know, if, I were to, if I were to say something and offend somebody, what would mean more to them? If I just said, oh, I'm sorry, and then keep going. Or if you stop and say, will you forgive me? It's much different, isn't it, when we ask for forgiveness? Will you forgive me? See, that's what God asks us to do when we've done something that's offended him or when we sin. When a person asks for forgiveness, what's occurring is they're asking for action. They're asking for something else to follow. You're asking someone else to do something. I think saying I'm sorry is kind of the easy way out. Because think about it, if you ask for forgiveness, you're risking getting a response that you might not want to hear. What if you were to ask for forgiveness from somebody, we know this doesn't occur with God, but what if you were to ask somebody forgiveness and they say, no. I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm the type, if that's the person I'm around, I don't want to be around them anymore, if they can't forgive. It's easier to say I'm sorry, than to put ourselves out there and ask for forgiveness. It's easier to just say I'm sorry than to risk being rejected. The reason we don't see I'm sorry in the Bible is because God doesn't want us coming to him and just saying, oh God, I'm sorry, I messed up, and then just keep going. God wants sorrow. He wants your feeling sorry to lead to repentance. He wants you to ask to be forgiven. And in 2 Corinthians 7, 9, it says this, Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. It said that their sorrow led them to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended and so we're not harmed in any way by us. What Paul is saying is, now I'm happy because you were made sorry, but that sorrow led to repentance. For you to ask God for forgiveness. Being sorry led to what God was looking for, true repentance. It led them to ask God for forgiveness. 
their sorrow led them to want to seek a response. It led them to change their lives and their actions. The response was they went to God, they asked for forgiveness, and he gave it. And when you receive it, it gives you the opportunity to grow and to change. And that's what God is looking for, is change. Change of heart, change of ways. I think too often we say, I'm sorry, but we don't repent. We don't ask for forgiveness, and therefore we never change, do we? Have you ever said, I'm sorry for the same thing because you've done it over and over? I think we can all find ourselves doing that. And that's maybe why God doesn't tell us to just say, I'm sorry, but to ask for repentance, ask for forgiveness, ask for an opportunity to change. Like the scripture said, God wants sorrow. Or I'm sorry that moves us to want to repent and then ask for forgiveness. Because God desires change. And that's when change comes, when we can realize to the point that we need to repent and ask for forgiveness. So we can move forward in our Christian walk, in our Christian lives. Something amazing, I think we need to remember, if you're willing to repent, if you're willing to ask God for forgiveness, if you're willing to confess it to God, God promises to forgive every time. It says this in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It says God forgives every time. God forgives every time. But isn't that a much different response than we seem to get sometimes in the world? In the society that we live in? How do we tend to respond? The world wants us to respond like Satan does. That we should keep paying for every sin over and over and over again. That we should have to wear it on our sleeve like some sort of a brand you put on a cow. That you have to live with it forever. But that's not what God desires. God desires that we ask for forgiveness because he'll forgive. And once he's forgiven, you have the clean slate and an opportunity to move forward without guilt, without resentment. God did that on purpose. You're given an opportunity to start over. Given an opportunity to change and be more godly. An opportunity to not make the same mistake next time. You're given the opportunity to allow God to change you over and over again. Every time you repent, every time you confess... Every time you ask for forgiveness, God doesn't make you pay for it anymore. God forgives. God lets it go. Because of his love, because of his grace, because of the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, he put that in place to forgive. So you could grow, so you could start over. And I think it's amazing. You know, there's no other religion in the world that can offer something as comforting as complete forgiveness. Because only God makes that offer when you come to him and ask. Because God knows when you're forgiven, when you see the error in your ways, when you repent and ask for forgiveness, it's an opportunity to become more godly, to find godliness. And y'all have heard me preach on godliness. It is the ability to think like God to act more godly, and to labor with God. So ask yourself this. So if God is forgiving you when you ask for forgiveness, if he is giving you the opportunity to repent and make changes, to become better in his eyes, shouldn't we as Christians be doing the exact same thing for others? Shouldn't you be forgiving other folks just like God has forgiven you? You know, we've said this before, but I'd sure hate if God forgave us like we forgive others. 
I'd hate to know that God harbored up unforgiveness like we tend to sometimes. Listen to what Jesus said. Y'all remember this. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. He was teaching some corrective doctrine to the Jews at the time. And he said this. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not want to forgive men of their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Thank goodness God doesn't hold that over us like he did to them back in that day. That if you didn't forgive someone, you would never be forgiven yourself. Think about it. If there was one person, just one, that did one thing that you could not forgive, then you yourself couldn't be forgiven. But Jesus knew what he was doing when he taught that doctrine. Jesus knew what he was saying. Jesus knew that a person that was not capable of forgiving was condemning themselves. I say it like this. If you're a friend of mine, you've heard me say this. It's like drinking a cup of poison and expecting it to kill somebody else. But that's exactly what unforgiveness does. Jesus knew that that resentment that we would hold against somebody else with unforgiveness in their heart would keep us from being able to live, live the kind of godly life that God wants us to live. Jesus was teaching that the first thing you should do is forgive somebody else just like God has forgiven you. Why? Because God gave us that example in the beginning when he sent his son to die for each one of us. Think about the feeling you had when you learned that God had forgiven you of every sin in your life, the moment that you asked for, you repented, asked for forgiveness, and put your faith in Jesus Christ. Your sins were forgiven. That God would forgive you as often as you asked. Remember what Peter said. Peter asked the Lord this. He said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus told Peter in Matthew 18, 22, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times, over and over again. You know, after about the 15th time, we'd probably forget how many times we'd forgiven somebody. But Jesus was saying that we need to get used to forgiving just like God does, the same way that God has. God wants you to forgive others even when you think they don't deserve it. It's not us up to us to be the judge. He wants you to forgive others even when you think they don't deserve it. Because he forgave you when you didn't deserve it. You should remember that no matter what someone else has done to you, it doesn't compare to your sins against God. Our sins against God, the Bible said it made us the enemies of God. Why? Because God can't coexist with evil. But he loved each one of us enough that he sent his own son so that we could be forgiven when we put our faith in him. I read this little saying, another pastor wrote it, I don't know who, a pastor, somebody wrote it, I don't remember who it was, but it says, don't let what has been done to you become bigger than what he did for you. Think about that. Don't let what has been done to you become bigger than what he did for you, because if you do... No one will ever get to see what he did for you. Think about that. If you can't forgive others, no one is ever going to see God working through you because all they see is resentment and unforgiveness. God desires for each one of his children to have a forgiving heart. God desires for you to be so full of love, so full of him, that you can forgive just like he does. You know, I read a little story years ago, and it really made a lot of sense. I think y'all can relate to this. There was a teacher one day that asked her two students, Jimbo and Larry, to do something. <laughs> so the teacher told Jimbo and Larry, she said, hey, why don't you each bring a big sack of potatoes to class? And on each sack, I want you to write the pers a person's name on each potato that you can't forgive. And I want, you to carry, I want you to put them back in that sack, and you go carry them everywhere you go all semester. 
Now, you know it can't be a true story because Jimbo and Larry wouldn't have been in class. But anyway, so what they did was they started carrying that sack of potatoes with them everywhere, in the truck next to them, wherever they went, they had to carry that sack of potatoes with them. And after a while, that sack that Jimbo and Larry was carrying started stinking so bad that you couldn't even smell their Saturday night cologne on them. And y'all know that because when they show up on Sunday, the greeters can smell them when they get out of the truck. But anyway, it was getting so bad that pretty soon when people saw them coming with that old sack of nasty potatoes, they wanted to run because it stunk so bad. But here's the thing we got to remember. When you harbor up unforgiveness like that, it begins to stink, doesn't it? Y'all ever know somebody that can't forgive somebody and every time you see them, you know it's coming. They just want to pour that stink out about that unforgiveness. After a while, you don't want to come to me with that because I'll just tell you, you stink and I don't want to hear it. Now, that might be wrong, but if you can't forgive, it gets to stinking. And what it does, it starts messing up relationships. People start dreading to see you. They don't want to hear it. Can you imagine the difference if you came up and said, man, that old rascal that got me, I forgave her. That speaks of godliness. That shows what God has done for each one of us. In Romans 5, 6, it says this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Down in the 8th verse, it says this. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then down in verse 10, for if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? His life. You need to show others Jesus Christ working in your life. You need to show others the same kind of forgiveness that God gave you. And forgive others. God never said, go tell somebody you're sorry. God never said, come to me and tell me you're sorry. He said, let your sorrow move you to repentance. To ask for forgiveness. And then let the action show up. Let the action show up. And what is the action? You're going to release yourself. And you're going to release others. When you forgive like God does. Because when you forgive like God forgives, he gives you something that's amazing. Peace. He gives you the peace that Jesus Christ left you with. The peace that you have released whatever it is you need to forgive somebody of. And that's why Jesus even said on the night that he was betrayed, when he broke the bread and got the wine, you remember what he said? You didn't come to the table until you'd forgiven others. Why? Because he knew you couldn't live a Christ-like life if you were harboring up unforgiveness. Amen. 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 While Carl is singing the next song, if there's somebody that would like to rededicate their life to Christ, would like to come up and pray with me in the front. Please feel free to come forward. So Oh, 
is calling, calling for I sure want to thank everybody for being here this morning. This is an incredible church family. It's the most incredible church family I've ever been a part of. All the love that we get from each other and the support, it's just, uh, it's amazing. I want to ask you to reach out to folks you might not have seen in a while. Let them know we're thinking about them, praying for them, and look forward to seeing them back soon. If y'all would, please bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just pray. We pray for those that aren't here today. We pray for any of those that might be harboring up unforgiveness. Or maybe it's just one of us. We pray, Lord, that we always see things through your eyes. We forgive like you forgive. Remember that forgiveness was so important to you that you sacrificed your son to bring us back to you. And Father, I want to pray for those that serve in our government, our men and women in the armed forces, our first responders, our teachers and our students. Lord, we want to pray for all people all the time. Pray for each one of us here today those that have not made it. But Lord, I just pray in all things that we put you first in our lives. We come to you for your wisdom and your knowledge. We find our direction, our path in life from you. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.